is my great pleasure to introduce an old friend and colleague who has been working on keeping our nation safe um, in the nuclear arena for, there you go. <laughs> and uh, Dave and I had the pleasure of working together once upon a time back in, oh, several administrations ago um, in Washington when we did a review of the stockpile stewardship program for Secretary Richardson at the time. Um, so Dave has joined the team that is meant new, newly minted to manage the, what most of us will continue to call the Nevada test site for as long as we live. Um, and Dave is down in Vegas and I told him he needed to come up north because he could meet some friendly faces. Some people who really um, do appreciate the national security role that not only um, many of the people in the room have played, but that the state of Nevada has played. So with that, Dave, welcome to the National Security Forum, and we look forward to hearing your comments about the test site. Okay. Uh First of all, I am I'm just absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, and it is, it is heartwarming to uh, see such a, a large community of people who are activated around national security. Uh, I just, uh, I appreciate that personally. And uh, as a uh, officer of a, of a uh, joint venture LLC now operating at the Nevada test site, uh, this is a relationship I wanna foster, I want us to grow. Uh, because uh, the more that we can understand uh, what we're doing in a broader uh, national global context, the more that we can um, achieve uh, important things that we want to achieve. Um, the, uh, one of the questions that, that I noticed that people ask me is, uh, well, what do I think of Nevada? You know, what do I think? And I live down in uh, Las Vegas. I live in, in, uh, in downtown. We have an office that's about three miles uh, north of uh, downtown Las Vegas, and then, of course, the test site is about 65 miles uh, northwest. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, my observation of uh, Nevada, the, the people are just wonderful, welcoming. Uh, I'm excited about the work. Uh, and, 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 but environmentally, it, it has all the amenities of a modern society, uh, but it's in a habitat that doesn't seem to grow a tomato. So, <laughs> but... But uh, man, I am ready. I'm ready to spend more time in Reno. I really like what I found in Reno. So what I'm gonna do is spend about 20 minutes, uh, walk you through the portfolio of activities that we have underway uh, down uh, at the Nevada test site. It's now called the Nevada National Security Site. And, and uh, hopefully my remarks will help create a little bit of a context for why that is. And uh, Patty said that I had a, uh, a device to advance slides. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I, I, would, I would find it hard to believe you live in Nevada and don't know something about the history of the Nevada test site. Uh, it was the... Uh, continental U.S. testing grounds uh, for nuclear weapons, uh, about a thousand nuclear tests that were conducted there, uh, about uh, 100 that were done uh, above ground, and then another 900 or so that were done below ground, either in vertical uh, shafts or in tunnels inside of mountains. Uh, in 1992, uh, we stopped testing and uh, have not had a full-scale nuclear test, a, a sustaining nuclear reaction test uh, since then. And it began the advent of a complex approach to how do you uh, understand and manage uh, the safety, reliability, and security of the nuclear weapons stockpile uh, without uh, conducting those nuclear tests. And, and I'll touch on that in somewhat. Today, uh, what we benefit from is a very unique national asset. Uh, so it's a large uh, area of land, about 1,360 square miles, that's uh, inside of another 5,000 square miles of the Nellis Air Force Range. And uh, it 
it uh, has all of the history of the nuclear weapons te uh, uh, testing program and the assets that are there. But what I'm going to touch on is all of the uh, investments that we've been making uh, over the last few years and the investments that we'll be making going forward. Uh, it is a very uh, diverse and unique uh, set of capabilities. It's the only place uh, where both uh, nuclear materials and high explosives can be mated uh, for the conduct of tests. Uh, uh, the only other place that high explosives and nuclear materials get mated is at the assembly disassembly facility that's in Amarillo, Texas. That's when you're actually making a nuclear weapon. Um, and uh, we have uh, about 2,200 people that work that support uh, this enterprise, and that ranges all the way from, from PhDs, uh, technical degrees, to uh, labor uh, and trades. Uh, lots of work going on. <clears throat> The three major areas that we support are stockpile stewardship, global security, I'll talk a little bit about what that is, but essentially that's, that's national security interests that are uh, not focused on the nuclear weapons uh, stockpile. And then we also do environmental management work, uh, principally supporting uh, dealing with the legacy that's at that site. So uh, the testing that began in the 1950s, there were a lot of different standards that existed. There was also different priorities, urgency around the work that needed to be done. And so we have had uh, a significant amount of work in going through and, and dealing with that legacy. Across that spectrum is, is management of the, st of the stockpile work, uh, non-proliferation and counter-proliferation, uh, counter-terrorism, uh, radiological incident response, first responder training, and then the support we do for other government agencies, and, and I'll be going through and highlighting each one of those. Whoops. Now, uh, there's a bunch of logos here, uh, uh, and uh, the key is, at the top is the Department of Energy, and the department now has an organization uh, uh, inside that is a semi-autonomous agency called the National uh, Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, th then that work flows through uh, the Nevada, Nevada Field Office, which is uh, located in North Las Vegas, as I talked about. And, and that represents uh, the scope of work that is not just the former uh, Nevada test site, but we actually have nine other locations uh, nationally. So outside, out of this contract, we manage facilities that are in California and New York and Andrews Air Force Base and all over in order to and conduct these missions. Uh, three key uh, uh, folks that are on this is the organization I work for, which is in the middle. It says MSTS, that's called Mission Support and Test Services. That's a uh, joint venture, essentially a group of companies that came together to bid the management and operating contract of the uh, NNSS uh, enterprise. And it was made up of Honeywell, Jacobs Engineering, and Huntington Ingalls Industries, which is a, a, a company that's associated with the uh, Newport News uh, shipbuilding. Uh, we've uh, had that contract since de December 1st of last year. There was a four-month transition, so I've actually been a Nevada resident uh, for about a year and four months. Uh, a couple of other contracts of note, uh, Navarro, that does the environmental engineering. So we are the central contractor to manage all the integrated interfaces, and uh, then uh, we work with Navarro, and they actually conduct the work that's in environmental management. SOC is the security contractor, so at that site we still have a separate security contractor different than the integrating contractor. And then the Desert Research Institute, which uh, many of you should be familiar with. They support us in uh, community environmental monitoring and also in the hist state historical programs that we have, keeping track of all the things uh, that have a si historical significance on the site. Customers. Uh, the 90 percent of the work we do supports the nuclear weapons stockpile. The other 10 percent is in those areas of global security and environmental management. Uh, outside of the stockpile, uh, we have lots of customers coming from the intelligence community. Uh, we have folks from the Department of Defense, law enforcement, and the Department of Homeland Security. And so what they're really looking for is real operational environments where they can exercise uh, their uh, tools, techniques, uh, uh, sensors, uh, human uh, operations in a real operational environment. Because if you go to our site, uh, it, they like that you can't grow a tomato there because it looks very much like uh, the sites that you would find globally. So we have, uh, we have geo geological uh, uh, 
features that are similar to nations of interest and so you can imagine these agencies want to come out and because we're inside of this Air Force range and then inside of our own boundaries it provides a lot of security uh, but we also have an operational envelope because we can do work with radiological things we can do biological simulants and we can do chemical work and so that enables us uh, to provide a suite of, of features and we're 65 miles northwest of, of Las Vegas in stockpile stewardship, um, as I said, we stopped doing nuclear tests uh, in uh, 1992, and what was put forth was an alternative. It basically was set as a challenge to say, well, if I can't do nuclear tests, how will I have the confidence going forward, and how long can I have that confidence? What would I do? And the National Laboratories got together with some good leadership uh, out of the Department of Energy, and they conceived of a program called science-based stockpile stewardship. And, and that, that says, uh, you know, normally when you make something, if you all go out in your garage and you make something, you might build something that performs form, fit, and function, right? You, you wanna, you need to build a shelf and you put a shelf on the wall and you, you, you put something together and you kind of test it and you're convinced if it works. You don't sit down and do a lot of scientific analysis on that shelf, right? And that's the way the nuclear weapons stockpile started, which is basically, People understood the principles of what it took to get a prompt critical uh, release of energy through a nuclear detonation. Uh, they put those resources together and they went out and tested it. And then they began to do lots of interesting tests that, that, that sort of explored ideas and concepts but in many cases, they left a lot of the first principles alone. Uh, if something worked, they kind of went with it. Well, when you stop doing nuclear testing, it's the things that you don't know that start to uh, give you the uncertainty. And so the, uh, the president at the time and the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy came together around a plan that said every year, uh, the national laboratories and the Department of Defense uh, will partner in terms of putting together a certification report and it would certify that the nuclear weapons deterrent, which includes the nuclear weapons and their delivery systems, uh, continue to be viable. And it was scientific methods that were put in place that were gonna help fill that void. If, uh, when I was a kid, I used to like, for whatever reason, to rearrange my room. You know, you, you, you inherit your, your, kid, your brother or sister's furniture and stuff like that, and I'm always interested in how to rearrange my room. I didn't just start dragging the furniture all around the room. Instead, I, I measured all the furniture, I measured the room, and I created a little model, you know, where you cut these little pieces out of paper, and you can arrange those pieces on paper, and you can come up with every way, right? It could be arranged. Well, that's exactly the kind of, I mean, it's more, we do more sophisticated than that, but that's the kind of modeling you do for nuclear weapons is because we all know materials around us, our own experience. It's like going in the garage and building that shelf. You know a table is hard, you know water's wet, right? But if you've ever seen high-speed photography, uh, if you've ever seen situations where you maybe put something in a fire, you realize those materials you think you know all about behave in a different way, right? So something that, that seemed to be a solid, you put it in a fire and it explodes. Or, or something that, uh, you know, a bullet, when you see a solid bullet and it hits a target in high-speed photography, you watch it blow apart. Well, it's that kind of understanding that we were missing. And so the national laboratories went about large-scale scientific facilities that began to understand materials, and is specifically nuclear materials, under high temperature and high pressure conditions, conditions that we don't normally interact with them. And uh, that was a great, that was that beginning part of science-based stockpile stewardship. So each of our national laboratories had facilities, began to collect data, and so they began to build that room model. Right? So they began to have all the pieces of paper so that as they arranged them, they'd be confident when they put something together, it would work. And progressively, we've had an, an envelope of what we don't know. And year after year, and it's now been uh, on the order of uh, 20, uh, since, since the early 90s, so it's on the order of 20 years, that envelope of what we don't know continues to shrink because we're gathering all the information about how these materials behave, and it's come around to integrated dynamic experiments that we do in Nevada. Whoops. 
I think this one, uh, this here. So uh, here's some examples of what we do. So in the old days, you would go out and, and it, you would, most of what you would have seen would have been these massive uh, detonations on, on the surface. And then potentially uh, you, would, you would have detonations that were underground and subsidence craters and all this data that was being taken. To now, today, what we do, nothing like that. We have a few pinpoint facilities and they are essentially laboratories built in some cases above ground, in some cases below ground. There's two pictures here on the left. This is inside of a tunnel that's about 1,000 feet underground. So we had a shaft that went 1,000 feet, and we have a, a network of about three miles of tunnels underground. And this is one of our laboratory facilities. Uh, this is the O5 drift, and the tunnel, is, the, the, the tunnel complex is called U1A. It's just a, a name that um, uh, had a historical significance, underground tunnel 1A. And essentially, we've built a laboratory down there that can take high-speed photographs with x-rays. So we can take nuclear materials and high explosives. We put it inside of a vessel, a steel vessel. So everything that we do stays contained inside of a steel vessel. So think of a three-foot ball, and inside you're going to do an experiment. And we actually have windows on that vessel. We shoot x-rays at high speed, and we take high-speed pictures of what's happening while explosives and this material are interacting. And, there, and we take that data, send it to the laboratories, and they compare it to their first principle models that they have built in order to see, did they get it right or not? And then they adjust their models in order to get higher confidence. And the whole idea is progressively, these models accurately predict what we do in a test. And we do, do both uh, nuclear tests and we do, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, tests that are not uh, critical, they don't end up in a sustaining nuclear reaction, but it's high explosives and, and nuclear material that interact. Uh, we also do uh, with other materials inside this. So three-foot vessel, that this machine down here called Cygnus, uh, its whole purpose is to create a lot of energy that gets converted into x-rays, no different than if you go to the doctor and you're going to get an x-ray, except these x-rays can take x-rays through solid steel balls. And that, and uh, very powerful. Uh, again, that's integrating all the experimental work that's been done other places uh, to those dynamic experiments on our site. Another area of interest uh, uh, is the specific activities of, as I said, under high temperature, high pressure. What happens to uh, plutonium? So just like this, this, this uh, podium is solid. But under certain conditions, the, it, would, it would be different, right? Obviously, if I put it in a fire, it would begin to slump and melt because it's, it's made of plastic. Uh, but the same thing, you need to understand what happens to plutonium under high pressure, high temperature. And so we have a two-stage gas gun. Essentially, that's like a, a long gun barrel. And there's a picture here you can see uh, right here on this, uh, right here, uh, which, which uh, as you can imagine, that's, that's about, you know, this, this kind of size of a long barrel. And what we do is we use gunpowder to push a piston. The piston squeezes a bunch of hydrogen gas down and squeezes it so tight it reaches a really high pressure. That pressure then breaks a disc, and then that pressure pushes a target of nuclear material. Uh, into uh, down down the chamber and into whatever it is we're going to impact it to, and down there that's where we take all this data. So again, we are generating all of this data around these d dynamic experiments either through two-stage gas gun or the experiments that are done in U1A. Boy, it's tender. Yeah, there we go. Um, so we have nuclear material. I've said that several times. We do things with nuclear material. Very long history in the Department of Energy of how you responsibly manage nuclear material, how you do nucle nuclear material operations, how you protect uh, nuclear material and for security. Uh, one of our assets is very unique. It's one of four facilities in the United States. It's called uh, the Device Assembly Facility. It has that name because during the, the full-scale nuclear testing program, they suddenly decided it probably was a good idea to be assembling the test devices they were detonating in a facility that was safe and protected rather than the old days, they would just do it in a build, you know, some metal building someplace. You know, it was sort of the priority was different. So this facility was built and actually was never used. We, we ended up stopping testing by the time that the, uh, by the time the building, I'm just gonna check my time here. Yes, yeah, by the time that that building got got going, so uh, it has. It's actually not one building. It's a, those are a whole series of buildings that are uh, under earthen berm, 
And uh, that is the place that uh, we stage nuclear material and where we assemble these devices that we would test in those three-foot vessels in U1A or those little targets that we test uh, at the Jasper facility. And the kinds of things that are going on in there, there's just some pictures, but but uh, all very well contained, very well managed, very high safety records, uh, uh, principally driven by uh, the requirements of the operations on the site. We also have a National Criticality Experiments Research Center. So this is a one-of-a-kind facility where you can, we can take nuclear material and configure it in ways that makes a, um, uh, essentially a, a, a test device, a, a device uh, that can create uh, streams of radiation, a uh, test object that creates uh, streams of radiation, and that's really useful to those people that want to do work like detecting when another nation has those things, or first responders that might be out trying to detect where something is. It's one thing to train as a first responder and pretend all the time. It's much more credibility when you're really having exercises in real environments with real hazards. That gives that first responder the confidence that they know how to manage the risks and the hazards, and that's what we do there. We also conduct uh, explosives work. So because we have explosives, we have a facility called BEEF. Somebody has a real clever idea on how to create names. Um, big explosives uh, experimental facility. And uh, uh, so uh, there we can do uh, work with explosives and other materials and again, take all kinds of data. So the key output of what we do is reams and reams of data that goes to the national laboratories. One of the uh, most exciting experiments we're doing right now has to do with uh, how, do you, how do you detect, how, and there's lots of agencies who are involved in detecting when other nations are doing things. You're, you're all aware of, of uh, North Korea and their activities. Uh, obviously, other nations are doing uh, uh, work uh, in uh, uh, nuclear weapons and perhaps not doing full-scale testing but doing other testing. And so international organizations are very interested in how do you detect what they're doing? How do you decide what they're doing? And so we'd, we have a, had a series of what are called source physics experiments, SPI. And source physics experiments, uh, essentially you create a, an event that simulates an event that might occur in another country and everybody gets to bring their stuff out and test it. And, and what's fascinating is in real operational environments, they'll realize something that works in a lab actually doesn't work in the field, and that's very useful. Uh, right now, we have a test underway that's called, uh, that, that's a part of this SPI test. Uh, lots of, we have granite areas out at that site, but we also have dry alluvium geology. So essentially, imagine it's like that, that crushed gravel that you have underneath a paver sidewalk or something like that that you put down, where that's everything that's in the ground. And there's other countries that have those areas. So we have a series of dry alluvium geology tests and where we set conventional explosives off underground, but very large. So like we did a 50, we're doing a 50 ton detonation soon, underground, deep. And all these agencies are are uh, on the site with sensors, they're on satellites with sensors, they're on the other side of the earth with sensors, and they're detecting because then they know exactly what it was we did, and they want to see what that looks like when they receive it in order to calibrate. We also have a, a very large site, about 67 acres, that is permitted to be able to do all of these real hazards operating tests. So I talked about chemical, radiological, and the uh, biosimulants. And so uh, it's, it's permitted. It has its origins in the Clean Air Act, where uh, there was a desire to characterize sort of every modern industrial uh, chemical known to man to understand what the permissible uh, limits and things were, uh, the capabilities there for release and monitoring have led to us uh, having uh, lots of customers that want to come and do that. It's all permitted, and uh, we manage and clean that up every time we work on it. We also, because we're the ones that, that know how to uh, create these events uh, and we have to manage our own risks, we're also perfect to be going out and doing response to other incidents and accidents. So if you have uh, a nuclear emergency, a nuclear incident, an accident, if, uh, if any time you have a consequence, you need to do consequence management, we're a great uh, resource for that. So we have a whole set of resources that are at Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, they're also at Andrews Air Force Base. And these are the resources that are dispatched anytime something suspicious happens. So let's say local law enforcement 
enforcement uh, somehow uh, finds that there's a radiological uh, hit in a junkyard someplace, our people will be dispatched to tell exactly what it was, what was the source. Many cases, it's something like a, uh, you know, a, a hospital was decommissioned and somehow a radioactive source got there or whatever. Same thing, our capabilities are such that uh, when we do aerial monitoring, we'll fly over cities and we'll create baselines and then during events we fly over and we look for differences. So we do like uh, for New Year's Eve on the, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, for uh, inaugurations, uh, for events, for marathons and things like that. We do that all the time. It's so accurate. If you are receiving chemotherapy where you have induced radiation in your body, we can track you on the ground from an airplane. <laughs> I told you. I told you about uh, the, and, and, and hopefully that sense gives you, gives you safety, right? Because if you're, if you're going to go watch your friend run in the marathon, then you have confidence that we're watching and we know what's going on on the ground. Uh, first responder training, I mentioned this, the way there's nothing better than the real thing. Uh, these pictures look kind of, uh, can look kind of scary because these people are in hazardous suits. The reality, they're not exposed to a chemical hazard. They're just dressed out in their normal gear. However, they are measuring real radiation because we will have put real radiation test sources out there. And uh, we saw after 9-11 that first responders were really caught flat-footed in real experience in dealing with the hazards. So you had a variation of people that, that uh, sort of were, were supposedly committed to respond, struggled to deal with the, the personal anxiety around what does this mean, am I at risk? This kind of training gives them that confidence. Uh, Big thing I want to leave you with. We are investing in the facility like never before. Uh, we have uh, massive investments uh, underway in our underground laboratories. So I talked about that underground laboratory uh, with the three-foot vessels and taking the x-rays. Uh, we have a project underway that's about uh, $750 million. That is uh, building additional tunnels and putting in a linear accelerator uh, which can both uh, generate better x-rays to be able to see through denser metals, so we can, we can squeeze metals uh, to a higher density and still see through them, see what's going on, and uh, potentially also create a stream of neutrons so we can actually excite, ex you know, uh, send a signal in and excite uh, nuclear materials to understand how their reactivity is changing. Because by default, Nuclear material, if, if you, uh, for the layman, nuclear material is, is isotopes of atoms that are around us that aren't stable. So if you think of an anvil or a hammer, uh, that might be uh, steel, and the, the atoms that make up that steel are stable. They're, it's going to be steel. 100 years from now, it's still going to be steel. There's nothing changing. But in the creation of... Uh, of matter, uh, certain things that were created, uh, elements were not stable. And by the time most of us came around, most of those atoms have become stable, meaning they decay into things that are stable. Nuclear material, things that uh, are fissionable, are inherently unstable. And uh, the, whole, the whole process uh, of, of understanding uh, what happens to materials as they change. So if we have a nuclear weapon that we built 25 years ago, and now it's 25 years later, that nuclear material has changed. And so we have to understand what's going on there. So in addition to the investments in U1A, you can see here we're also investing in things like roads. There's lots of roads on the site, high performance computing. Uh, we're putting in power systems, power grids. Uh, we uh, are putting in a whole slew of $20 million buildings. Uh, in order to better support uh, the research and technical staff that are there. So it's really evolving from a test site to a place to work for scientists and engineers where they happen to be co-located to the testing location. Uh, we're also committed to the community. We, uh, this year we're going to hire about 350 people spread across uh, scientists, engineers, and trades. Uh, so if you know anyone that's looking for work in those areas, please let us know. Uh, need U.S. citizens. Uh, they'll have to have a, a clearance uh, to work on the site. Uh, but so we're very interested in digging deeper into the pipeline to develop relationships with students in these areas in order to uh, help improve our pipeline of the people that we bring in. Uh, I summarized uh, here a little bit, which is funding, but you can see the funding for the site has been going up tw uh, 2019. Uh, 
this is just the stockpile work, $550 million. Uh, we have a budget uh, allocation on the order of $750 million. And again, as this work goes on, uh, it'll continue to grow. So that is my summary. I'm sorry if I went just a little bit over time. And now I think uh, Maureen has been collecting the questions. And, uh, and I, will, uh, I will try to make sure I stipulate when I'm offering an opinion versus a fact. Thank you, Dave. It is always good for us to know what's going on in our backyard. And as Nevadans, we should be proud of the long legacy of work that's been, that has been done there. And we're very grateful that you and your team are uh, shepherding us into a new era on the test site, because I think this is incredibly important. So yes, we have lots and lots of questions for you. So. Um, Let's start with the stewardship questions, because that was really the focus of where you're fo you, you're, what you're looking at. So you mentioned a little bit about uh, testing materials. Okay, so you mentioned that we need to assess whether our nuclear materials remain stable. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what does that entail, if you can. And then the second question is, what about all that non-nuclear stuff? Is it, um, are you also looking at the non-nuclear components, which most of a weapon is non-nuclear, and do we need, are they decaying, and do we need to uh, invest in refurbishment, and if so, are you involved in that? Yeah, so about, um, I'll start with the second part first. So about uh, 15 years ago, uh, a careful set of studies were done on all these non-nuclear components, what I'll call the weaponization components. So if you want to make a nuclear weapon, you need uranium or plutonium and high explosives. And so that's why, from a non-proliferation standpoint, you really focus. You don't want people to be getting uranium or plutonium, right? Because then you can, you can stop what's going on. But pretty much, uranium, plutonium, high explosives. Takes a lot of smarts, but that's what you need. All the parts that then go around that, the weaponization components, provide safety, security, and reliability. So you want to make sure a weapon is never going to go off unless it's intended to go off. You've, you've directed that it needs to go off. The other thing is, once I've directed I need it to go off, I also want to make sure it doesn't inadvertently go off somewhere between where it starts and when it's actually supposed to go off. So there's a very complex regimen that's been uh, created for nuclear safety that ensures that a nuclear weapon not only sees the intent of the president, so the president has authorized a weapon to be used, that's a unique uh, key I'll call it a key, but it's an electronic signal. And then we build parts on weapons that when they fly to the target, their flight environment, actually flying through their environment, whether it's a, a submarine-launched ballistic missile or a cruise missile, they actually have to see their actual flight environment to, to make the other key. And then those two, uh, two keys unlock to allow energy to get to detonators. So, the reality is if a bad guy steals a nuclear weapon, I mean, we watched the James Bond movie, I've seen him, the bad guy steals him, he pulls off the cover and inside there's a big number keypad and a wireless remote control. <laughs> it is not at all like that. It, 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 would, it is almost surprising that a nuclear weapon can actually work because of the safety controls that have been put in place. And those are the non-nuclear components. They also have to be reliable. Right? And they also have features, other features inside that potentially uh, are, are safety and security features. About 15 years ago, the decision was made, we got to replace these. Because they, the old ones had vacuum tubes. Uh, you know, you all know that you, have a, you, know, you had a VCR. I mean, some of you remember the VCR, right? The other day, somebody gave me a VHS tape. And I, didn't, you know, I went and dug around in my basement. And I found a VCR. And I stuck it in. And it kind of worked. But you know, electronics just don't last forever. And so a decision was made. And so there's a whole life extension program philosophy that went through and analyzed every component. What were the risks? And there's been significant investment in the stockpile to replace those non-nuclear components, rest assured. Great program, great work, exercising great people, ground-based testing, flight testing, things like that that help prove that works. Nuclear materials, a lot harder problem. 
So the first instinct is, is expert judgment. You had people who designed nuclear weapons who early on vouched for whether or not it was good for another year or not. Progressively, as they got further away from testing, they began to identify what are the attributes they want to have. Here's an example. When you shock plutonium, just go back to my podium, you don't see it here, but I, I can hit the podium and you didn't see anything happen. But in reality, when I shocked that podium surface, all kinds of particles came up off of it. If we had a high, you know, really high magnification, high speed camera, we would have seen all kinds of stuff happen. That kind of stuff happens with plutonium. So when you shock it with explosives, and when it was new, maybe it was fine. As it gets older, it might have all kinds of things flying off of the surface. You know, like your concrete driveway, how sometimes you get, you get chunks of concrete that all of a sudden will fall off. That's called spall. Same thing happens with materials. So, so lots of study up front around spall and ejecta, the dust that comes off and the chunks that come off. So we did subcritical tests, full dynamic experiments at NNSS. Uh, in those vessels to understand uh, what is the effect of spall and ejecta. Then you also have maybe machined features in the material, and now we're getting down to the level of understanding the actual change in the reactivity of the nuclear material, and that's the next wave of tests. So uh, the assurance is, uh, uh, based on the expertise, uh, we have replaced non-nuclear components. Uh, that's underway. We're, we're about finished with the replacement of non-nuclear components for a bomb for the B-61. Uh, our site tends to, to play roles that involve uh, full-scale testing, so like fire-based testing uh, or uh, uh, fragmentation, where if something exploded next to a nuclear weapon, what would be the effect? Uh, but we partner with the other uh, sites in the nuclear weapons complex for that. On the nuclear materials side, that's the heart of what we're doing, is gathering that data on materials. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. That was very helpful. Um, let's talk about something that's timely and in the news right now, which is the president is um, negotiating or threatening Russia to withdraw from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, which uh, basically banned um, short-range nuclear weapons, many of which were at some point deployed in Europe. Um, there's also talk in the, in the news about, oh, well, if we get out of this treaty, we're going to go into uh, rebuilding our short-range nuclear arsenal. Um, we're talking things that went out and mortar shells and backpacks and that type of stuff. Um, can we do that? Would we have to test those if we were to rebuild them since we haven't had them in the arsenal in 30-plus years? Um, so first of all, um so I'll just make some observations because uh, there's also, there, there's, there's evidently, you know, there's geopolitical kinds of plays that an administration might be doing versus what they're actually trying to accomplish. And so it's, it's a bit of an aside that the Trump, had, um, had, Trump specifically talked about pulling out of this treaty. And so that's a, that's a proposal and there's a lot going back and forth in the UN with regard to, to what the actions would be. It's interesting, the, the founders who wrote the Constitution said the Senate gets to advise and consent on the approval of a treaty, but they didn't say anything about getting out of it. So the president can get out of a treaty anytime they want, which is, 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 is in my opinion, that's a, that's a little bit problematic because our best strategy is not to get out of a treaty. Best strategy is to, is to uh, uh, increment on a treaty, right? And so essentially what happened is, is uh, Russia for some time has been doing things that treaty watchers would say, hmm, that looks like a violation of this intermediate nuclear forces treaty, which is a tongue twister, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-proliferation or a uh, treaty, treaty uh, uh, tongue twister. Essentially, they have uh, some cruise missile systems that they've uh, put in Russia, uh, uh, and uh, those systems are ground-based missiles uh, that uh, potentially could have nuclear warheads on them. And so, if you look at that, you'd say, well, if that's a cruise missile, it's ground-based. That's a violation of that INF treaty. Similarly, though, the United States has put. Uh, systems up in Poland and other places that are anti-systems. Uh, uh, essentially, it can shoot a rocket to shoot whatever comes down, but theoretically, you could put anything in that rocket that's going that way, so maybe the U.S. is kind of skirting it a little bit. Historically, the best approach is to, to stay the ground around an agreement and try to increment on that. The current approach of the administration is, is to threaten to pull out of it and essentially kind of uh, return to essentially enable everyone to go back to a more aggressive threatening policy. Um, it is my personal opinion that uh, we can build new nuclear weapons. 
likely what we would do in the event that we were called on to do that is look at reuse, reuse of something that did have underground uh, test pedigree. However, uh, very quickly, we are closing, uh, closing the book in terms of what it actually takes to make a nuclear weapon. The harder part is having a factory that can make those parts. And uh, for some 15 years or so, the, the government has spent a lot of money trying to reconstitute a, a, a set of processes that uh, were allowed to die. It used to be a Rocky Flats facility in Colorado that was the place where uh, 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 plutonium uh, pits, as they would call it, so a, a pl the plutonium part of a nuclear explosive were made. That facility closed. Uh, there were some preliminary decisions that, well, uh, going forward, we'll reconstitute a capability or we'll just extend what we have. Uh, today, that work is done uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and it's not easy. It's not easy because the bar you have to meet is, has been changing. In the old days, like I said, you make something and you go out and kind of do what they call an admiral's test. You'd actually test it. And if you're, you're, it seems confident that it works, you didn't worry about the details. Now you go back and worry about the details. And so they actually get down to the fact of, gee, the thing they made at that old place wasn't actually pure. While the drawings and the requirements said it was pure, it actually had impurities in it. Do we build impurities into the new one, or do we build the new one pure? <laughs> okay, and I'm, that's yeah, it's funny, but it's that's the challenge. And then uh, then there's the complexity of our decision uh, uh, to to commingle national laboratories with production facilities. So I think from a technical standpoint, competency exists. Uh, from a material standpoint, we have the materials. Uh, from a um, you know geopolitical government policy standpoint, boy, that would be a huge uh, change from what our position has been. Uh, that INF treaty allowed us to essentially eliminate a whole class of nuclear weapons, reduce the nuclear danger. We actually got we just both sides destroyed thousands of nuclear weapons systems that don't exist anymore, and uh, and essentially walking away from the treaty kind of tells people, well, if you want to go ahead and start building again, you can, and maybe we will. And for now, it's rhetoric, uh, but. Um, if you want, we can talk more about that uh, off afterwards. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate that. Um, so you mentioned you went beyond the nuclear work, and you mentioned your global security work. So in particular, could you give us a little bit of insight as to some of the chemical and biological work that you do there? Yeah, so, um, so chemical and biological. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, as you, if you've paid attention to the news over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a few incidents of chemical attacks. And uh, so there's a lot of work trying to understand how do you respond to a chemical attack in different environments. So if you go out to our site, we actually have things like aircraft fuselage. We have rail cars. Uh, you know, we have uh, sort of surrogates for uh, subway tunnels and things like that that are instrumented so that as we uh, conceive of threats that maybe we haven't seen or where we encounter a real threat, then you can understand you can go in and actually test and see, well, what are the implications of that and how bad it is. Um, there, um, you know, that, um, that is a serious priority for the U.S. government because uh, proliferation of information on the Internet uh, smart people who seem to be aligned with uh, anarchical or, or perhaps uh, nihilist kind of thinking. Um, it's, um, uh, it is very serious. Having an asset like we have is very important. Um, the biological simulants, uh, it's sort of in the same category. Uh, you know, it's, it has the same effect. Uh, it more complex for someone to develop a, a biological element. Uh, or biological agent uh, that tends to be a state actor, uh, but uh, very important, and our assets key to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so along those lines, and you mentioned, um, you know, a lot of these threats that we face take set aside the nuclear for right now, but um, a lot of radiological, chemical, biological, um, those are threats that uh, we share with our allies, and even some of our not allies from. Uh, trans, transnational groups. Does do you have programs that involve foreign governments coming out there? Yeah, and in we, particular, do you have anything that involves Russia or China? Yes. As a matter of fact, Monday we have some Russians who are on our side, uh, and and you know that's sort of that that careful uh, process that you walk where you want to you want to cooperate 
to share the best of what you have. So the U.S. government's been very good about sharing any philosophies we have around nuclear safety. So not not how does how do we uh, uh, how do we provide security of our stockpile, but instead where we have safety concepts or features. Happy to share that with anyone that has nuclear weapons. Uh, we also, there's been years of collaboration uh, with helping the former Soviet republics uh, understand how to uh, better deploy their uh, technical talent in a way that ensures that they're focused on uh, research that is good versus uh, perhaps finding themselves not having a paycheck. $30 a month would go a long way uh, to one of those researchers in in Russia, and so therefore you can imagine the the attraction to to might be to pull you off to a rogue country. So uh, it I won't describe it as routine, but it is very carefully managed where we bring foreign nationals on uh, the site uh, in order to have collaboration. And this uh, current collaboration with uh, Russia deals with understanding uh, applications for their former test site, consistent with applications that we have. Excellent. Thank you very much. So you talked about lots of things that you do on the test site. Do you generate waste when you do that? And then what do you do with it? And then what's happening with the waste that was already there? What happened to all that stuff that resulted from all those te underground tests and above ground tests? What are we looking at in terms of environmental contamination on the site? So there's 1,360 square miles. 93% of that is pristine. It's never been touched. Uh, in fact, DRI, other uh, ecological study groups love going out there because it's been protected lands. They love going out because there's Native uh, American artifacts, there's untouched uh, natural habitat, and things like that. So 93% untouched. The other 7% is, when I say touched, is means it was a dirt road, there was a road, there was a building, uh, there was the spot where a nuclear test was done, or whatever. So that, that gives you the scale, is all this stuff's pretty concentrated. Then the whole site has been characterized environmentally, and, and that has been, uh, very careful understanding of every event and activity went on, what was the materials that were used, what were the consequences, what is the legacy, and that includes uh, soil sampling characterization, groundwater characterization, we have active wells that are monitoring uh, to make sure we understand what's going on in shafts and tunnels and every place. Then uh, DOE's arm of environmental cleanup, which is called environmental restoration, they have uh, been for years underway with uh, identifying the highest priority areas that should be cleaned up. And uh, we have a waste management cell on the site that's active, and it's a few acres. So everything gets uh, consolidated uh, uh, down uh, to packages that are then uh, you know, essentially put in a landfill, in, in a monitored landfill where they're stored. So it, it's concentrating it. Um, the tests that we do actively, those, that waste management unit is uh, regulated by the state, and, uh, and the tests that we do actively uh, that generate any kind of waste, that waste would be cleaned up and put in that, that fill. Now, we're not going back, and because of the scale of the operations that went on there, we're not going back and trying to take every location there was a nuclear test and restoring it to a green field. Uh, but instead, it's identifying where there is any material or contamination on the surface. And uh, we have about 10 years left of environmental work in order to attain the agreements that we have with the state and what, what is appropriate in terms of, of it. But the site, it will be a commitment of the federal government forever uh, to uh, maintain and uh, monitor uh, what's going on the site. The current work we do uh, the, the, let's say the work at U1A is these experiments that are, that are performed in a steel vessel I talked about. Um, just as in the nuclear weapons test, you would uh, take nuclear material in a device and set off that device, and, and in terms of the nuclear material inventory, that was considered expended. So the material was expended and in an underground test. Since we did a site-wide environmental uh, impact statement and gone through and review, there was a, uh, a position taken that the tests that are done underground in U1A in the vessel, uh, it was acceptable practice to perform the test in the vessel, and there's actually no 
uh, there's some different regulatory standards, uh, but uh, there's a, there are uh, different waste standards. But essentially, the material that was expended inside the vessel, the current approach is that's entombed in the tunnel. So uh, it's contained in that vessel, and entombed means it's just concreted in. And, uh, and it's a, it is a small compared to uh, the expended material that was from nuclear tests. Uh, but that's always a consideration looking forward in terms of you know, uh, what, what the state's interested in, what stakeholders are interested in. It's all done transparently. You know, the process has been communicated. Anytime there's a, a change in what anyone thinks that standard needs to be, you arrive at what that means. And if we had to go and extract uh, such vessels and put them someplace, uh, that would be uh, you know, an agreement between the state and the Department of Energy. Uh, we as the operator would just uh, take whatever decisions is made and do, do what needs to be done. So there is waste that's created. It's uh, industrial waste. There's some low-level radioactive waste. Uh, that stuff is treated like any of the other waste we're consolidating in our waste management unit. Uh, in the event there is any high-level waste, there's other uh, waste storage or uh, waste uh, disposal locations for high-level waste that are not in Nevada. Excellent. Thank you. So um, you said the word tomb. Okay. Speaking of tombs on the test site, um, what was the one topic that I told you you were probably going to have to address but may not want to? It's a four-letter word called yucca. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Five. Um, I know, I know, but it, you know, it's that. Yeah, yeah, but it's not this. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to summarize this stack of questions to um, simply, yeah, what about yucca? And remember, you're in northern Nevada. You're in friendly territory. You can say nice things here. Um, obviously, the, many cases, the things that we do, uh, there are three, three attributes, I think. One has to do with the sunk cost. So there's, there's resources at that test site that are there. The government's put billions of dollars in, and we're always looking to figure out how, how do you get utilization of it. Uh, the also is then what's the missions that we're confronted with, and then what's the nature of the environment that we're, we're working in in terms of what's the support for it. All I'll say is our contract, the MSTS contract, does not have responsibility for Yucca Mountain. Uh, we, do, we provide some operational support, but we don't have responsibility there. But boy, that's a tremendous amount of sunk cost, a tremendous asset that exists. And uh, it, it's important that uh, everyone look at an opportunity for uh, how that uh, could best be utilized um, uh, for, for whatever purpose. Um, there have been notional discussions that I've heard about, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, a, um, additional missions that might come to the site and there might be a role for some interim staging and things and like that but but essentially uh, that is a political decision uh, uh, beyond uh, anything that we would comment on the contract uh, the key is uh, just rationalizing the sunk cost taking use making good use of things that are available uh, that's that's wise Th did i stay away from that answer yeah that was pretty artful So um, there's a follow-up question on that, which is, um, is reprocessing a potential use of the Yucca Mountain facility? So uh, there, there are several groups. Uh, and could you explain to the group what reprocessing is? Yeah, there's, uh, there's several groups in the community that have uh, sort of raised a hand and talked about um, some interesting ideas around a uh, future. And um, if you believe uh, that nuclear power plays an important role in uh, energy security and the future of the United States in, 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 in national security in terms of how we might uh, provide uh, energy for military operations and things like that, sort of disking, connecting from the grid. Small modular reactors is a great solution. It was a it was a really a big push in, around the George W. Bush administration, uh, dealing with lots of issues that got away from the reactors we all know and love and got around to standardized designs with uh, regulatory insurance and then a government-owned fuel supply that would lease fuel to operators. Um, and part of that model involves something called reprocessing because there is a travesty in the nuclear industry, which is we spend all this money to go find nuclear material in the ground, like uranium, 
We mine it out of the ground and cause you know, environmental insults in that process. We have industrial processes to enrich that. Uh, we build it up into nuclear fuel. Uh, we put that nuclear fuel in a reactor and, and we create a configuration that, that has a, uh, a sustaining nuclear reaction that creates a lot of heat. And most of the time in the US that boils water and turns a turbine and makes electricity. But the way you design a reactor is, is kind of like, um, you know how if you had a cupcake and uh, you take the cupcake and you just lick off the icing and put the cupcake back and then you get another cupcake and you lick off the icing and put the cupcake back? That's the way the nuclear uh, fuel works is you design a reactor where you just take a little bit of that icing off and then you put this other thing back and you got all this cake and you have some icing left on there, you know, but you got to do something. You can't put it back in the same reactor. And so that's where nuclear fuel reprocessing comes along. It says, let me take those old cupcakes and let me turn them back into new cupcakes. And, uh, but there was a decision made during the Carter administration that, you know, uh, maybe we, we didn't want other countries doing reprocessing. We didn't want to have to deal with commercial companies uh, having the potential proliferation of reprocessing information, nuclear materials. So there's a decision, a policy decision made the United States wasn't going to reprocess nuclear materials. But from a efficiency, productivity standpoint, reprocessing is the way you do it. Alternatively, you can have other reactor designs, breeder reactor designs, and other things like that that kind of change the model of, of the fuel cycle and enable fuel reprocessing. Um, so most of the fuel from nuclear reactors now goes through one cycle in the reactor. That fuel is put in a pool local to the reactor where it cools for a while. The spent fuel pool is what it's called. And then uh, those fuel rods uh, are destined to go someplace, uh, long-term storage or, or, or the, there's actually an insurance program or a, a fund that exists to, to deal with that. Well, um, so there was a big push around building these small modular reactors and that this would be the way to be more efficient, uh, produce uh, cheap energy through electricity and uh, all this sort of stuff. Fukushima Daiichi happened, of which we responded with our uh, nuclear search team and monitoring, sent our pods over and all that sort of thing. But, but that really soured a lot of the momentum around uh, small modular reactors, but more importantly, fracking. So fracking the, 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 uh, the, the oil and gas industry really got smart around fracking. Right now, through fracking, there's enough natural gas that's been released in the United States to provide all of our energy and energy growth requirements for 100 years. So who's going to buy a nuclear reactor? Now, if you're an environmentalist and you believe that uh, that that man-made global that, that global warming is somehow man-made influenced. A nuclear reactor is an excellent solution to to avoiding uh, that global warming, but that's not a consensus, right? So right now, uh, natural gas it's too much of it. It's too cheap in the United States. Don't expect to see a boom in small modular reactors or reprocessing. However, Japan, other company, other countries, and things like that. Now. What does is, what is our site potentially play a role in it? There are specialty niches where I said small modular reactor, maybe I need to have one in an Air Force base or a, a Navy base because I want them to have independent power. So we're looking at scenarios that, you know, would we be a site to put up a reactor, stress test it, and then, uh, but chances of reprocessing probably pretty low. But the small modular reactor is nice because it, it's a more safe configuration. It doesn't have the same uh, intrinsic hazards that some of our boiling water reactors have. Excellent, Dave. Thank you very much. So before you go reprocessing your Christmas cupcakes, um, let's give Dave a big welcome. Thank you for a fabulous presentation.